All right, we left off uh, last class discussing book five and uh, the portrait of uh, events that uh, narrated by Raphael. The books uh, Raphael narrates, by the way, to uh, Adam uh, comprise books five, six, uh, seven, and eight. Uh, interesting fact, often overlooked. And in some sense, the, the very center of the entire epic is contained within uh, those uh, within that narrative, and with the central event being the uh, ascent of Messiah to the throne of God, which precipit precipitates uh, Satan's uh, rebellion and consequently uh, the uh, temptation and fall of mankind as well. But I will get to the structure of the poem uh, later on in my discussion at that uh, crucial point when we come to the ascent of messiah uh, i will speak of the overall structure of paradise loss and we'll get a sense of how milton uh, has not only created a, a majestic work here uh, but also one that's intricately woven and connected by number in many ways you heard me mention that uh, in the uh, Renaissance period, and certainly long before that, going all the way back uh, to the classical world, the, there were seven liberal arts, three of them associated with word, uh, logic, uh, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and four of them associated with, with number. So there are sciences of uh, word and sciences of number. And uh, I want to begin with, uh, before I move on to what I spoke of last time, the discussion of the three days of war in heaven, which take place in book six, with something of uh, setting the stage here again uh, for that discussion. And I, I want to begin with a discussion of astronomy in conjunction with that and the harmony that resides between the constellation of the planets and the uh, harmony that lies within the human breast. Now, I've already spoken of that in terms of music uh, when speaking of uh, back in my lecture on uh, Milton's Nativity Ode, and you can see that online uh, in a, uh, a previous link that I had. I'm going to, so I'm going to start reading, however, from uh, book five, line 621. Of planets and of fixed in all her wheels resembles nearest mazes intricate eccentric intervolved yet regular than most when most irregular they seem and in their motions harmony divine so smooths her charming tones that god's own ear listens delighted so the music connected with the harmony of the constellations and the music of the spheres being referred to here now milton is leaning here on uh, neo uh, Platonic uh, Christian ideas that astrological proportions uh, indicate a resonance between a soul and a planet. And um, and this uh, belief continues all the way through to, to uh, Francis, uh, Johannes Kepler. And, uh, and um, quoting uh, Pseudomicrobius here, so an earlier writer that Lewis mentions, uh, C.S. Lewis mentions in uh, the discarded image is one of the foundational texts, primary texts for medievalists to understand. Uh, Macrobius says this, he said, it is natural for everything that breathes to be captivated by music. Since the heavenly soul that animates the universe sprang from music. And that's interesting. Uh, in and of itself, that statement, and certainly, uh, it. Uh, if you're interested in Tolkien, you will also see that it it uh, underlies his portrait of uh, the cosmos as it unfolds in uh, the Silmarillion. It it issues forth from from song, but a sense of proportionality there. Now that song and that music, that heavenly music, uh, is the uh, regular uh, sound that is heard in heaven. And I'll move on a few lines here because then there's the uh, note of discord there. In the same way that Tolkien does also in Silmarillion, we find here that the melodious hymns, 656, about the sovereign throne alternate all night long, but not so waked Satan, so call him now. His former name is heard no more in heaven, 
he of, of the first, if not the first archangel, great in power, in favor and preeminence, yet fraught with envy against the Son of God, that day honored by his great father and proclaimed Messiah king anointed, could not bear through pride that sight and thought himself impaired. So I mentioned the centerpiece of the of Paradise Lost being the exaltation of, of the Son of God to the throne and honored as king. Uh, mentioned, by the way, if you're looking for scriptural references, the key text here would be in uh, Psalm 2, why the nations rage and the people plot in vain. Uh, the nations here will be associated with angelic beings, by the way, as well. Uh, Again, uh, widely held medieval belief that nations are guided by angels, but here the nations guided by the angels are, are fallen angels. And Satan is thought himself impaired by the father's exaltation of the son and uh, his uh, declaration thereof. And at that point, then the fall uh, or the uh, ensuing drama ensue, uh, takes place. And uh, I'll read on line 666, six, uh, six, six. deep malice vents, conceiving and disdain. Remember the line 666 six, six here in book five might be seen to correspond with the portrait of death in book two. These correspondences, by the way, are not accidental. Uh, and those who have studied Milton's text in terms of, uh, uh, in ter terms of numerology and so forth uh, have found vast uh, resemblances and patterns there, the like of which uh, most of us would not even uh, consider, but they are there. And uh, if you're interested in that, I particularly commend you to a scholar by the name of uh, Marin Sophie Rostvig. Um, uh, her, in particular, her book, 1994 book, uh, Configurations, a Topomorphical Approach to Renaissance uh, Poetry. Uh, it's particularly strong. Um, although not for the uh, beginner, all the same. I'll talk more about some of the general contours that we can see here um, in a few minutes here. But he thought himself impaired and deep malice thence conceiving and disdain. Soon as midnight brought on the dusky hour friendliest to sleep and silence, he resolved with all his legions to dislodge and leave unworshipped unobeyed the throne supreme contemptuous and his next subordinate awakening thus to him in secret spake note thus in secret spake sleeps thou companion dear what sleep can close thy eyelids and rememberst what decree of yesterday so late hath passed the lips of heavens almighty thou to me thy thoughts wast wont i mine to thee was wont to impart both waking we were one how then can now thy sleep descent? New laws thou seest imposed, new laws from him who reigns, new minds may raise in us who serve, new counsels to debate what doubtful may ensue. More in this place to utter is not safe. Assemble thou of all those myriads which we lead the chief. Tell them that by command, ere yet dim light her shadowy cloud withdraws, I am to haste. And all who under me their banners wave homeward with flying march where we possess the quarters of the north there to prepare fit entertainment to receive our king the great messiah and his new commands who speedily through all the hierarchies intends to pass triumphant and give laws so spake the false archangel and infused bad influence into the unwary breast of his associate. Note this word influence, uh, derived again from the planetary uh, interactions as well, the relations between the planet, this word influence. So unlike the good influence of the plants created by God, which creates a celestial music and harmony, uh, Satan exerts, or rather infuses, as Milton's word, a malign or bad influence into the unwary breast of his associate. He together calls of several, one by one, the regent powers under him regent, tells, as he was taught, that the most high commanding, now ere night, now ere 
dim night had disencumbered heaven, the great hierarchical standard was to move, tells the suggested cause, and cast between ambiguous words and jealousies to sound or taint integrity. But all obeyed the wonted signal and superior voice of their great potentate, for great indeed his name, and high was his degree in heaven, his countenance, as the morning star that guides the starry flock, allured them, and with lies drew after him the third part of heaven's host. A very uh, brief synopsis given here by Raphael of Satan's uh, deception of the uh, of a third of heaven's host, the arch, uh, angels that followed him. Meanwhile, line 711, the eternal eye whose sight discerns abstrusest thoughts from forth his holy mount and from within the golden lamps that burn nightly before him, saw without their light rebellion rising, saw in whom how spread among the sons of morn, what multitudes were banded to oppose his high degree and smiling to his only son thus said. This is the father speaking to the son. Son, thou in whom my glory I behold in full resplendence, heir of all my might, nearly it now concerns us to be sure of our omnipotence, and with what arms we mean to hold what anciently we claim of deity or empire, such a foe is rising who intends to erect his throne equal to ours throughout the spacious north. Nor so content hath in his thought to try in battle what our power is or our might. Let us advise and to this hazard draw with speed what force is left and all employ in our defense, lest unawares we lose this our high place, our sanctuary, our hill. To whom the sun with calm aspect and clear lightning divine, ineffable, serene, made answer mighty father thou thy foes justly hast in derision and secure laughs at their vain designs and tumults vain matter to me of glory whom their hate illustrates illustrates when they see all regal power given me to quell their pride and in event know whether i be dexterous to subdue thy rebels or be found the worst in heaven, so spake the sun. But Satan with his powers far was advanced on winged speed and host innumerable as the stars of night or stars of morning, dewdrops which the sun impearls on every leaf and every flower, regions they passed, etc. And what do they do? They construct, line 760, the palace of great Lucifer, so call that structure in the dialect of men interpreted, which not long after he, affecting all equality with God, God in imitation of that mount whereon Messiah was declared in sight of heaven, the mountain of the congregation called. For thither he assembled all his train, pretending so commanded to consult about the great deception of their king, thither to come with, and with calumnious art of counterfeited truth thus held their ears. Uh, so this moment of Satan's fall um, uh, comes uh, in imitation of what God has done here. So there is a parallel. Um, so he creates a palace and mounts as if he had been exalted in imitation of God. And uh, if you want to see some scriptural uh, support for this you might want to look to isaiah uh, verse uh, chapter 14 verses 12 to 15 in reference to uh, the king of babylon which was interpreted by uh, justin martyr and origin uh, as a reference uh, to satan an allegorical reference uh, to satan um, but he boasts here and he is defamatory the word cal cal calumnious art is used and counterfeited truth and then he will give a, and remember Raphael's giving us a, not the whole speech, but a sense of the specious uh, nature of Satan's speech. I'll, I'll give a bit of that before coming to the great uh, rejoinder by, by one angel. So this is the speech. Thrones, dom dominations, princedoms, virtues, powers. If these magnificent titles yet remain not merely 
titular, since by decree another now hath to himself engrossed all power, and us eclipsed under the name of king anointed, for whom all this haste of midnight march and hurried meeting here, this only to consult, how we may best, with what may be devised of honors new, receive him coming to receive from us knee tribute, yet unpaid, prostration vile, too much to one, but double how endured, to one and to his image now proclaimed. But what if better counsels might erect our minds and teach us to cast off this yoke? Will ye submit your necks and choose to bend the supple knee? Ye will not, if I trust to know ye right, or if ye know yourselves natives and sons of heaven possessed before by none, and if not equal all, yet free, equally free, for orders and degrees jar not with liberty, but well consist. Who can in reason then or right assume monarchy over such as live by right his equals? If in power and splendor less, in freedom equal, or can induce law and edict on us, who without law err not, much less for this to be our Lord and look for adoration to the abuse of those imperial titles which assert our being ordained to govern, not to serve. In this, uh, uh, one of uh, Milton's great uh, editors, uh, Fowler here in the edition I'm reading from right here, uh, mentions that uh, in Satan's words here, there is a, an implicit reference to the uh, Stuart monarchs, Charles I and uh, his uh, successor for that matter, the assertion of the divine right of kings, uh, which is based on the right to govern rather than to serve. So that language is being uh, echoed here by, by Satan. He sees power as something that he has as his, uh, his own uh, intrinsic right, as something to rule uh, rather than to serve. And um, Milton will obviously see Christian service modeled on Christ precisely as that. Even uh, authority is predicated on the idea of service rather than of governance, uh, something that we would uh, well remember in our own days and in uh, positions of uh, relation to the, not only the public square, but within the church. Leadership, true leadership is predicated on service and not on the right to govern. There is no such right per se. But in response to this specious uh, speech, which does sway a third of the rebel angels, there is one who is not persuaded and his name is Abdiel. Abdiel, who is a great hero to Milton and some see in Abdiel uh, Milton's reflection upon himself. Uh, I'll leave that comment aside, uh, but let's look to Abdiel's speech here. Thus far, his bold discourse without control had audience. When among the seraphim, Abdiel, uh, Abdiel, by the way, means servant of God. So in response to the claim that they are ordained to govern, not to serve, Abdiel, servant of God, responds and rejoins. Uh, that speech with his contrary speech. Uh, when among the seraphim Abdiel, than whom none with more zeal adored the deity and divine commands obeyed, stood up and in a flame of zeal severe, the current of his fury thus opposed. Oh, argument blasphemous, false and proud, words which no ear ever to hear in heaven expected, least of all from thee, Ingrate in place thyself so high above thy peers, canst thou with impious obloquy condemn the just decree of God, pronounced and sworn, that to his only son, by right endued with regal scepter, every soul in heaven shall bend the knee, and in that honor due confess him rightful king? Unjust thou sayest, flatly unjust to bind with laws the free and equal over equals to let reign one over all with unsucceeded power 
Shalt thou give law to God? Shalt thou dispute with him the points of liberty who made thee what thou art and formed the powers of heaven such as he pleased and circumscribed their being? Yet by experience taught, taught we know how good and of our good and of our dignity, how provident he is, how far from thought to make us less bend rather to exalt our happy state under one head more near united but to but to grant it the unjust that equal over equals monarch reign thyself though great and glorious dost thou count or all angelic nature joined in one equal to him begotten son by whom as by his word the mighty father made all things even thee and all the spirits of heaven by him created in their bright decree degrees crown them with glory and to their glory named thrones dominations princedoms virtues powers essential powers nor by his reign obscured but more illustrious made since he the head of the head one of our number thus reduced becomes his laws, our laws, all honor to him done, returns our own. Cease then this impious rage, and tempt not these, but hasten to appease the insensate father and the insensate son, while pardon may be found in time besought. So spake the fervent angel, but his zeal none seconded, as out of season judged, or singular and rash, whereat rejoiced the apostate and more haughty thus replied that we were formed then sayest thou and the work of secondary hands by task transferred from father to his son strange point and new doctrine which we would know whence learned who saw when this creation was remembers thou thy making while the maker gave thee being we know no time when we were not as now no none before us, self begot, self raised by our own quickening power. When fatal course had circled his full orb, the birth mature of this our native heaven, ethereal sons, our puissance is our own. Our own right hand shall teach us highest deeds by proof to try who is our equal. Then thou shalt behold whether by supplication we intend address or, and to begirt the almighty throne beseeching or besieging this report. These tidings carry to the anointed king and fly ere evil intercept thy flight. He said, and as the sound of waters deep, hoarse murmur echoed to his words, applause through the infinite host, nor less for that the flaming seraph fearless, though alone encompassed round with foes thus answered bold o alien it from god o spirit accursed forsaken of all good i see thy fall determined and thy hapless crew involved in this perfidious fraud contagion spread both of thy crime and punishment henceforth no more be troubled how to quit the yoke of god's messiah whose indulgent laws will not now be will not be now vouchsafed other decrees against thee are gone forth without recall. That golden scepter, which thou didst reject, is now an iron rod to bruise and break thy disobedience. Again, a reference to Psalm 2. Well thou didst advise, yet not for thy advice or threats I fly these wicked tents devoted, lest the wrath imp impendent, raging into sudden flame, distinguish not. For soon expect to feel this, his thunder on thy head, devouring fire. Then who created thee, lamenting, learn. When who can uncreate thee, thou shalt know. So spake the seraph, Abdiel, faithful found. Among the faithless, faithful only he. Among innumerable false, unmoved, unshaken, unseduced, unterrified his loyalty he kept his love, his zeal, nor number nor example with him wrought to swerve from truth or changed his constant mind, though single. From amidst them forth he passed, long way through the hostile scorn, which he sustained superior, nor of violence feared aught, and with re 
torted scorn, his back he turned on those proud towers to swift destruction doomed. Thus concludes the uh, fifth book of Paradise Lost with this uh, heroic uh, retort from Abdiel, servant of God, in response to those who claimed that they had a right by virtue of their native uh, constitution to govern and to rule and to be equal to no one without their uh, consent, uh, denying God his prerogatives as God, denying God his divinity, in fact, claiming that they had their ethereal spirits um, uh, of their own nature. Uh, book six continues, and it does then depict the war in heaven that ensues. And it, it talks about how um, Michael, or sometimes as he's referred to, Mikael, and Gabriel are sent forth to battle against Satan and his angels. And there are there are there are three battles, as it were. Although the third is not so much a battle as uh, the vanquishing of the foes. But the first fight, um, uh, recall a council. Uh, there's a second day's fight, and then the third day's fight. Um, where shall I pick it up here? Uh, I think I shall pick it up in uh, with the Father sending um, no, let's take with the reception of uh, Abdiel by the Father. He returns among line 22, among those friendly powers who him receive with joy and acclamations loud. That one, that of so many myriads fallen, yet one returned not lost. Note the the way uh, in Jesus' parables that the, the father rejoices in the one lost sheep rather than in uh, those that he already has. There's great rejoicing. Uh, and on the sacred hill they led him high applauded and present before the seat supreme. From whence a voice from midst the golden cloud thus mild was heard. Servant of God, well done. Well hast thou fought the better fight. Who single hast maintained against revolted multitudes the cause of truth in word mightier than they in arms. And for the testimony of truth has borne universal reproach, far worse to bear than violence. For this was all thy care to stand approved in sight of God, though worlds judge thee perverse. The easier conquest now remains thee, aided by this host of friends, back on thy foes more glorious to return than scorned thou didst depart and to subdue by force who reason for their law refuse right reason for their law and for their king messiah who by right of merit reigns so reference once again in milton uh, here as we saw also in his defense of free speech in area pagetica of the high importance of truth in Milton's understanding, which he will reiterate throughout his corpus of works and a uh, holding to the truth. Biblical emphasis, one uh, extremely strong in Milton as well. So now the father sends his angel armies out to battle. Go, Michael, of celestial armies, prince, and thou in military prowess next, Gabriel, Lead forth to battle these my sons invincible. Lead forth my armed saints by thousands and by millions ranged for fight. Equal in number to that godless crew rebellious. Them with fire and hostile arms fearless assault. And to the brow of heaven pursuing, drive them out from God in bliss. Into their place of punishment. The gulf of Tartarus, which ready opens wide his fiery chaos to receive their fall. So at this point, if not earlier, a reference to Tartarus, a pagan uh, type of hell, mentioned uh, as far back as Homer, and the fiery chaos that uh, is uh, connected with that. We saw that back in book two, a reference to uh, the chaos. Uh, and uh, presumably, uh, hell is created at the moment of Satan's fall. But there is a reference here that it will be there uh, to receive them. Uh, did not exist before this point, but now it does. So spake the sovereign voice, and the clouds began to darken all the hill, and smoke to roll in dusky wreaths. Reluctant 
flames. The sign of wrath awaked, nor with less dread the loud ethereal trumpet from on high gan blow, at which command the powers militant that stood for heaven in mighty quadrate joined of union irresistible moved on and silenced their bright legion to the sound of instrumental harmony that breathed heroic ardor to advent adventurous deeds under their godlike leaders in the cause of God and his Messiah. Note again the reference to the instrumental harmony that goes with this as opposed to the uh, malice and the perversion and the discord that comes with Satan's uh, cohort. And they uh, meet these armies. Where shall we pick it up? Um, note that uh, Milton is no pacifist. Um, and Abdiel goes out and, say, and meets with Satan, line 109. Before the cloudy van on the rough edge of battle, ere it joined, Satan, with vast and haughty strides advanced, came towering, repeated reference to Satan as a tower, a proud tower eminent, uh, like the Tower of Babel, uh, armed in adamant and gold. Uh, this, this will be a reference to the description of uh, uh, Vipsanius Agrippa, the general who establishes imperial Rome on the ruins of the Republic. So there's tyranny being threatened here by Satan. Satan uh, is going to bring in an empire rather than a republic, a limitation, an understanding of freedom. Remember, Milton is the Republican. Satan is dressed in the guise of an imperial figure. Um, Abdiel that sight endured not, where he stood among the mightiest, bent on highest deeds, and thus his own undaunted, undaunted heart explores. Abdiel's thoughts here. And what we will get in a second is a parley. This happens before the battle is enjoined. The parley, which is sometimes used to uh, sue for peace and sometimes to uh, present terms of uh, on, upon which one will accept uh, the defeat of one's opponent. Um, and so this, this happens before battles. But this is Abdiel's thoughts. Oh, heaven, that such resemblance of the highest should yet remain where faith and realty remain not. Wherefore should not strength and might where there fail where virtue fails or weakest prove where boldest, though to sight unconquerable. His puissance, trusting in the Almighty's aid, I mean to try, whose reason I have tried unsound and false, nor is it aught but just that he who in debate of truth hath won should win in arms, and in both disputes alike victor. Though brutish that contest and foul, when reason hath to deal with force, yet so most reason is that reason overcome. So pondering and from his armed peers, forth stepping opposite, halfway he met his daring foe, and at this prevention more incensed, and thus securely him defied. Proud art thou met? Thy hope was to have reached the height of thy aspiring unopposed, the throne of God unguarded, and his side abandoned at the terror of thy power of potent tongue, fool. Not to think how vain against the omnipotent to rise in arms, who out of smallest things could without end have raised incessant armies to defeat thy folly, or with solitary hand reaching beyond all limit, at one blow unaided could have finished thee and whelmed the, thy regions under, under darkness, but thou seest all are not of thy train. There be who faith prefer and piety to God, although though then to thee not visible, when I alone seemed in thy world erroneous to dissent from all, my sect thou seest. Now learn too late how few sometimes they may know where thousands err. And so this is flighting before the actual combat begins, whom the grand foe with scornful eye askance thus answered, ill for thee. But in wished hour of my revenge, first sought for thou returnst from flight, seditious angel, 
to receive thy merited reward, the first assay of this right hand provokest, since first that tongue inspired with contradiction durst opposed a third of the gods in synod met their deities to assert. No Milton's reference to uh, Presbyterian uh, forms of congregation and opposition. Um, uh, Satan himself calling their congregation a synod. Uh, for who, while they feel vigor divine within them, can allow omnipotence to none. But well thou comest before thy fellows, ambitious to win from me some plume, that thy success may show destruction to the rest. So this will be a, a lesson to you. And Abdiel replies, and these are important words, and I'm not going to repeat the, or read the entirety of book six, but uh, replies in brief, apostate, uh, so he, sorry, how does uh, he conclude his words? Such hast thou armed the minstrelsy of heaven, servility with freedom to contend. You're a ser servile, I'm free. As both their deeds compared this day shall prove. You're a servile figure, I'm a free man, and I am going to win. Not a free man, but a free creature, says Satan. To whom in brief thus Abdiel stern replied, apostate. Still thou erst, nor end wilt find of erring from the path of truth remote. Unjustly thou depravest it with the name of servitude to serve whom God ordains or nature. God and nature bid the same. When he who rules is worthiest and excels them whom he governs. This is servitude to serve the unwise. This is servitude to serve the unwise, or him who hath rebelled against his worthier, as thine now serve thee, thyself not free, but to thyself enthralled, yet lewdly darest our ministering upbraid. Reign thou in hell thy kingdom, let me serve in heaven, God ever blessed, and his divine behests obey, worthiest to be obeyed, Yet chains in hell not realms expect. Meanwhile, from me returned, as erst thou said, from flight, this greeting on thy impious crest receive. So saying, a noble stroke he lifted high, which hung not, but so swift with tempest fell on the proud crest of Satan that no sight nor motion of swift thought less could his shield such ruin intercept. Ten paces huge his he back recoiled, the tenth on bended knee, his massy spear upstayed, as if on earth winds underground or waters forcing way sidelong, had pushed a mountain from his seat, half sunk with all his pines. Amazement seized the rebel thrones, but greater rage to see thus foiled their mightiest. Hours joy filled, and shout presage of victory and fierce desire of battle, whereat Mikael bid sound the archangel trumpet. Through the vast of heaven it sounded, and the faithful armies rung Hosanna to the highest, nor stood at gaze the adverse legions, nor with less hideous joined the horrid shock. Now storming fury rose, and clamor such as heard in heaven till now was never. Arms on armor, clashing braid, horrible discord, and the madding wheels of brazen chariots raged. Dire was the noise of conflict. Overhead, the dismal hiss of fiery darts and flaming volleys flew, and flying vaulted either host with fire. So the battle is enjoined, but it is enjoined after Abdiel strikes Satan with a mighty blow and pushes him back 10 paces and uh, thereby demonstrates uh, his claim, how, how specious his claim was to. Uh, strength uh, that uh, was anything resembling God's. Uh, the number 10 here, by the way, uh, is the symbol is a symbol of divine creativity uh, in, in biblical understanding of, of numerology. The 10 steps that he takes back are the 10 steps of destruction uh, that comes uh, that is a presage of Satan's ultimate fall from heaven down into the abyss prepared for him, uh, which I mentioned already. I will skip over the, the, the first battle, but there is a uh, then the 
uh, speeches between Michael and Satan. But note that also I, I read those lines and they were really interesting. Uh, from Abdiel, almost echoes of what Satan himself says that it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven at the outset of paradise lost. Um, note Abdiel's words, reign thou in hell thy kingdom, let me serve in heaven God ever blessed and his divine behest obey worthiest to be obeyed, yet chains in hell not realms expect. Um, the echoes that Milton uses throughout uh, the speeches of Paradise Lost in reference to what the the true nature of freedom is and the true nature of obedience uh, and this is connected with uh, the the true nature of of God uh, which will be the centerpiece of book six as I says and I'll come to that in in a second here but in interaction uh, between uh, Michael and and Satan and uh, and Satan uh, again with his perverse speech uh, being called uh, his actions being called evil Satan taking issue with this calling he says err not that thou that so shall end the strife which thou callest evil line 289 but we style the strife of glory which we mean to win or turn this heaven itself into the hell thou fablest here however to dwell free if not to reign meanwhile thy utmost force and join him named almighty to thy aid i fly not but have sought thee far and nigh they ended parley and both addressed for fight unspeakable so there's the parley between michael and satan here and again the terms of understanding in relation to evil uh, note that Satan says, you call it evil, I call it glory. You call it servitude, I call it freedom. So what is at, at stake here in all of this is what we understand by these very terms of, of freedom, of slavery, of servitude, of truth, of goodness, of evil. All of these things are up, to, up for discussion. And note that uh, Milton, it very, very nearly, and in fact, uh, entirely connects all of these things with the right worship of God or false worship of God. <clears throat> at any rate, they uh, enjoying battle, and at this point, of course, Michael uh, swings with his sword uh, and cuts through Satan into his right side. So, uh, Three twenty-seven, who for the first uh, first time knows pain, cuts him right through. In fact, but because he is made of uh, a, uh, uh, he's an immortal, uh, the ethereal substance closed, where we read in line 330, not long divisible, and from the gash a stream of nectarous humor issuing flowed sanguine, such as celestial spirits may bleed, and all his armor stained erewhile so bright, Forthwith on all sides to his aid was run by angels many and strong who interposed defense while others bore him on their shields back to his chariot. Um, so he has been cut through and nectar comes out of him in the uh, understanding of, of, hum of physiology in this day. There are different humors. Uh, Satan, because he's an immortal, has a nectarous humor sanguine that arises out of him. Um, I'll skip over the first battle though. It ends and uh, Satan is, although he's suffered terrific blows to his pride, first of all, whacked on the head by Abdiel, then sliced through the middle by uh, Michael. He nonetheless survives the first day and with this uh, claims a sort of a victory because of course God has not triumphed as he said uh, he would. He's not almighty because we are still here. Oh, now, 417, 418, in danger tried, now known in arms not to be overpowered, companions dear, found worthy, not of liberty alone, to mean pretense, but what we more affect, honor, dominion, glory, and renown, who have sustained one day in doubtful fight, and if one day, why not eternal days? What heaven's Lord had powerfulest to send against us from about his throne and judged sufficient to subdue us to his will. 
but proves not so. Then fallible, it seems, of future we may deem him, though till now omniscient thought. True is, less firmly armed, some disadvantage we endured in pain, till now not known, but known as soon contempt, since now we find this our imperial form incapable of mortal injury, imperishable, and though pierced with wound, soon closing and by native vigor healed. Of evil then, so small as easy think the remedy. Perhaps more valid arms, weapons more violent, when next we meet may serve to better us and worse our foes, or equal what between us made the odds in nature none. If other hidden cause left them superior, while we can preserve unhurt our minds and understanding sound, do search and consultation will disclose. And so what at this point? Uh, there's a challenge to Satan's leadership by a, a figure called Nisroch. Um, and there's a sort of a suggestion here of some sort of uh, principalities uh, of, of evil and a hierarchy thereby. Nisroch of principalities, the prime. Uh, Nisroch, by the way, is the idol that uh, Zennacherib uh, died worshipping, mentioned in uh, 2 Kings 19, verse 37, and also Isaiah uh, 37, verse 38, uh, this reference to Nisroch. So it's an idol that was worshipped by the Assyrians uh, and uh, connected with a, uh, a, a, a luxurious, soft sort of temptation. Uh, a name, uh, a sort of a flinching, um, a corrupt, not hard, like we'll find Moloch will be, who's just crazy, battle crazed. Uh, Nisroch, on the other hand, is a, uh, the name suggests a soft or luxurious sort of temptation, which Milton calls of principalities the prime. He challenges what has happened here because they've suffered hurt, and Nisroch, above all things, hates pain. He says, 460, uh, uh, 459, sense of pleasure we may well spare out of life, perhaps, and not repine if we don't follow your course of action, Satan. But pain, eh, eh, but live content, which is the calmest life. But pain is perfect misery. The worst of evils and excessive overturns all patience. He who therefore can invent with what more forcible we may offend our yet unwounded enemies or arm ourselves with like defense, to me deserves no less than for deliverance what we owe. So he's challenging Satan's primacy here in the battle. And Satan puts him back here. The first challenge here, uh, or the second challenge after Abdiel had challenged him. Um, so he moves on and he thinks of a means of, of assaulting them. And what will that be? Well, they will they will invent effectively cannons, uh, cannons which were used for the first time in the English Civil War and uh, and the gunpowder that arises from it. So they're going to dig down into the uh, into the heavens. And uh, there's a little mention here by Milton line for 502 or so forth, how this would be um, um, the archangel um, Gabriel here recounting uh, the uh, iniquitous nature of these sorts of weapons. He says that yet haply of thy race in future days of malice should abound someone intent on mischief or inspired with devilish machination might dissolve a devise like instrument to plague the sons of men for sin on war and mutual slaughter bent. And they create these things. So this is day two. Uh, which take which picks up at line uh, 537 uh, with the uh, with Zophiel, a spy of God, is the uh, the name here. Uh, speaking, arm warriors, arm for fight. The foe at hand, whom fled we thought, will save us long pursuit this day. Fear not his flight. So thick a cloud, a cloud he comes, and settled in his face, I see sad resolution and secure. Uh, and then Satan speaks, and once again, there's a parley. Uh, he speaks in 558. I will skip over that for the, so, uh, for the sake of time here. Uh, and at that point, the cannons fire, uh, because Satan's pretense to parley is just that. It's pretense to let the get the enemy's art guard down, and then he brings out 
and uh, he pretends a hollow truce we reread 578 and each behind a seraph stood and in his hand a reed stood waving tipped with fire while we suspense collected stood within our thoughts amused not long for sudden all at once their reeds put forth and to a narrow vent applied with nicest touch immediately in a flame but soon obscured with smoke all heaven appeared so boom they light the cannons off and the cannons go through the ranks of God's angelic host. At which point they are amazed and shocked and uh, all sorts of scatological references to the uh, disgorging of the foul, devilish glut uh, disemboweled from the uh, cannons uh, and they hit. And in response to this, uh, Michael and his angels pluck up the mountains of 644 uh, the seeded hills with all their load rocks waters woods and all but the and by their shaggy tops uplifting bore them in their hands amazed be sure and terror seized the rebel host when coming towards them so dread they saw the bottom of the mountains upward turned till on their cursed engines triple row they saw them whelmed and all their confidence under the weight of mountains buried deep themselves invaded next and on their heads main promontories flung which in the air came shadowing and oppressed whole legions armed so this is the rejoinder to it all the same all the same the uh uh the response here uh of uh, uh god uh to this is uh to put a stop to it god is the destruction of heaven is now spreading and God speaks uh, and the the son is incensed as well and God the father says effulgence of my glory son beloved son 680 in whose face invisible is beheld visibly what by deity I am and who in whose hand what by decree I do second omnipotence Two days are past, two days as we compute the days of heaven since Michael and his powers went forth to tame these disobedient. Sore hath been their flight. Sore hath been their flight, as likeliest was, when two such foes met armed, for to themselves I left them. And so forth. And thou knowest, equal in their creation, they were formed, save what sin hath impaired which yet hath wrought insensibly, for I suspend their doom. Whence in perpetual fight they needs must last endless, and no solution will be found. War wearied hath performed what war can do, and to disordered rage let loose the reins, with mountains as with weapons armed, which makes wild work in heaven and dangerous to the main. Two days are therefore past, the third is thine. For thee I have ordained it, and thus far, thus far uh, have suffered that the glory may be thine of ending this great war since none but thou can end it into thee uh, such virtue and grace immense I have transfused that all may know in heaven and hell thy power above compare and this perverse commotion govern thus to manifest thee worthiest to be heir of all things to be heir and to be king by sacred unction, thy deserved right. Go then, thou mightiest. <clears throat> so then he does, in fact, march forth. Um, I'm thinking here in my notes. Um, what have I got here? Uh, this is the centerpiece of the book here. Um but I have the lines wrong. Yes, I've just written them down wrong. Um, and uh, and then the sun, so the sun goes forth and the and the chariots of praise and, uh, are are ringing as this declaration goes forth. And we are told at this point the chariot seven fifty of paternal deity flashing. Thick flames, wheel within wheel, undrawn, itself instinct with spirit, but convoyed by four 
cherubic shapes, four faces each had wondrous, as with stars their bodies all, and wings were set with eyes, with wings the wheels of barrel, and careering fires between, over their heads a crystal firmament, whereon a sapphire throne inlaid with pure amber, and colors of the showery arch, he in celestial panoply, all armed of radiant urim, divinely wrought, work divinely wrought, ascended. At his right hand, victory sat eagle-winged. Beside him hung his bow and quiver with three bolted thunder stored. And from about him, fierce effusion rolled of smoke and bickering flame and sparkles dire, attended with 10,000 thousand saints. He onward came far off, his coming shone. And 20,000 either number heard, chariots of God half on each hand were seen. This is the centerpiece of the whole story, uh, line 762. And I just want to uh, now address very briefly, I, I'm not going to deal with the whole conflict now, because basically all that Messiah does is appear and the anger in his face, he appears and the rebel angels, there is no conflict, there is no fight, there is no battle joined. The Messiah appears, simply appears in this chariot, wearing the Urim on his breast, the Urim, which is the, the, the breastplate, uh, of precious stones and metals uh, that is is worn by the uh, in the temple on Aaron's breastplate and all sorts of symbolism connected with this. Some connect this with the philosopher's stone uh, as well. Uh, the right sun itself, the right Urim. Remember, in the new heaven and the new earth, there is no more sun uh, because the the Son of God is that light. He's the right sun. Uh, so, some some sort of references to that here, uh, but m the Messiah is wearing armor, and it suggests his agency also in creation. Uh, and and this the, this will be the philosopher's stone, uh, and it's a it mediates between God and the material world. So therefore, but the line six seventy two, with the word ascended, and I've gotten it written down wrongly here, but still. Um, I've got 672 rather than 762, but all the same. This is a discussion here of number and structure in Paradise Lost. And the centerpiece of the entirety of Paradise Lost, I want to take a, a few moments to discuss this and conclude with this thought, is right here in uh, Paradise Lost, Book 6, Line 6, uh, 762. Um, and here's the structure, which I think is roughly correct here. Books 1 and 2 are a mirror image, more or less, of books 11 and 12. But whereas books 1 and 2 depict the effects of the fall of the angels, books 11 and 12 depict the effects of the fall of Adam and Eve and mankind. Book 3, there's a council in heaven, uh, and the at the conclusion of book 3, Satan entering the world. In book 10, there is a council... But this council in heaven, at the conclusion of this, Satan leaves the world to the boos and hisses of his uh, fallen angels who are still residing in hell. In book four, there is the scene of the first temptation. We've just dealt with that. Satan in the guise of a toad whispering into Eve's ear. In book nine, we will have the second temptation, the actual fall of mankind when Satan now is in the guise of the serpent. And finally, in book six, we have the note of Messiah's triumph. As I said, line 762, when he ascends, is the moment of victory at that point. And it's the centerpiece of the entire epic. When Messiah ascends his throne, this is the thing that drives the entire plot. So for the romantics who thought that Milton was the hero of Paradise Lost, the structuring of Paradise Lost and not to mention Milton's theology in general, but the clear structuring of Paradise Lost, if one reads it attentively, will demonstrate that Messiah is, in fact, the hero of Paradise Lost. Everything hangs upon him, as it were, and his, his correct kingship, to which the idea of servitude and uh, or true service and freedom in obeying, uh, obeying the one who is worthy to be obeyed is the center message of Paradise Lost. But that's right here. So Messiah's triumph is, is presented in 672, whereas his creation is presented in book seven. We'll come to that next time in book seven. But um, you'll note that we skip over five and six, but uh, 
but again we're talking about not we're talking about not about the books per se but the themes that arise out of it and so i've drawn these sort of parallelisms here here but there's a clear structure now remember what i said here that uh that 10 had a certain uh significance in god's created harmony 12 associate is associated with uh, earthly completeness and temporal fulfillment milton began with a 10 book uh epic and but by 1674 he had changed it to a 12 book epic to suggest a temporal fulfillment not everything can be said that can be said but in terms of those who reside in space and time milton asserts it most clearly so this is part of the brilliance of the presentation of paradise law lost is how intricately woven this is and again i mentioned that book by uh rostvig configurations of topomorphical approach to renaissance poetry in which you can read more if you're interested in that but uh, as i say the there is no battle per se but they there is the messiah simply appears and the rebel uh, angels fall back into the abyss uh, and fall to the place that was prepared for them by god at the moment of the rebellion their fall was also so ordained and I'll leave off with that and we'll pick it up next time.